Hi everyone, um, I'm really excited to be here and I'm really grateful for the, for the opportunity to uh, present the HIV AIDS legal assessment tool to you. Um, copies are available for free, um, I think all of you grabbed it um, and if you need more for your colleagues please go ahead and grab them as well. Um, let me start with what the world is talking about right now. Um, tomorrow, the global community will unite in observing the World AIDS Day um, with a renewed commitment to getting to zero. And getting to zero means getting to zero new HIV infections, zero discrimination, and zero AIDS-related deaths by 2015. From the Empire State Building to the Sydney Opera House in Australia, iconic landmarks around the world will once again turn red. And for every beverage you buy at Starbucks, <laughs> the company will donate five cents to the Global Fund to fight HIV, AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria. So go ahead and buy your coffee tomorrow or even more than once. Of course, thousands of events and meetups will be held across the globe and people will rejoice in listening to the Dance Red Save Lives um, album featuring the biggest names in dance music. Both social um, and traditional media are already saturated with the World AIDS um, Day coverage, quoting top-notch experts, politicians, journalists, celebrities, advocates, who are all calling um, and urging decision makers to make one more big push to conquer HIV AIDS and achieve um, HIV AIDS, actually just AIDS free generation for now. And um, the most uh, recent epidemiological data is um, quite promising. Um, the 2012 World, Day, um, uh, World the AIDS Day report shows, um, uh, among other things, a 50% drop in new HIV infections in 25 low and middle um, income countries since 2001. Of course, delivering an HIV, um, a, a, an AIDS-free generation is a shared responsibility of all countries and all people around the globe. And this includes the legal community, because the world is suffering not only from HIV epidemic, the world is also suffering from widespread HIV-related discrimination and an uh, epidemic of really bad laws, policies, and policing practices, which target people living with HIV and people of, at high risk of acquiring HIV, including sex workers, people who use drugs, men who have sex with men, transgender people and people under state custody who are commonly referred to as key populations. Eliminating HIV-related discrimination, which is very often entrenched in national legal frameworks, and embracing a human rights-based approach to HIV and AIDS are absolutely critical to curbing the spread of the epidemic and building democratic societies. When people living with HIV and key populations enjoy equality in all aspects of their private, private and public lives, they are more likely to seek testing, to uh, receive counseling, and maintain their um, treatment. Conversely, discrimination forces people underground and increases their vulnerability to HIV and AIDS. Therefore, programs that address HIV and AIDS must be integrated and coherently managed with initiatives directed at strengthening the rule of law and promoting human rights. This requires high-impact legal and institutional assistance um, to developing countries, assistance that views rule of law mainstreaming and broad multi-sectoral collaboration as integral components of the AIDS response. To facilitate um, rule of law programming and technical legal assistance in the context of HIV and AIDS, the ABA Rule of Law Initiative has um, developed the HIV AIDS Legal Assessment Tool, which is a mechanism for assessing countries' compliance with international legal standards on the protection of people living with and affected by HIV. 
The tool is uniquely equipped not only to uncover the incidence of discrimination, but also to address such questions as whether the country's legal system is sufficiently strong to protect people from HIV-related discrimination, and to assess whether the government has committed appropriate resources and taken concrete steps to protect people um, from discrimination and from human rights violations in, um, in practice. More specifically, the tool is designed to provide a concrete picture of both best practices and challenges that need to be addressed in a particular country in order to eliminate HIV-related discrimination. So the primary um, focus of the tool is discrimination against people with HIV in public and private life. But also the tool devotes a separate section um, of its analytical framework to key populations who experience unique HIV vulnerabilities and therefore require special attention in, in line with the principle of equity. To enhance uniformity in and detail in data collection, we have developed the assessment methodology manual, which is the um, tools core document, and you, uh, as I mentioned, it, it's, you can grab it for free. It also will be available online, um, and I can also send it to you via email. Um, my cards are on the table. You can grab them. The manual provides guidance to lawyers and civil society organizations to, um, in how to implement the HIV AIDS legal assessment. It also describes the applicable international legal and policy framework. It offers an analytical framework and also clarifies terminology, outlines a number of research techniques, and discusses um, such issues as safety and um, ethical uh, issues around um, uh, conducting uh, the, the assessment, around conducting the research. It also presents a model former format for assessment reports and lists useful resources. So the most important part of the assessment um, tool is uh, the analytical framework. And I can refer you to page number, I should know this better. <laughs> Page number 35 in the tool. So the tool, um, the tool's analytical framework consists of 22 factor statements, which serve as indicators or principles used to analyze domestic laws policies and practices in key areas where HIV-related discrimination is likely to occur. The factors are divided into four sections, access to essential services, equality of people with living with HIV in public and private life, key populations, and access to justice. It is um, important to note that the tool directly ties all its indicators to international legal standards on the protection of human rights of people living with HIV and key populations. These principles are derived from a variety of international um, standard setting documents and um, other sources of international law. Um, of course, there is no one um, international treaty that deals specifically with HIV-related discrimination, so we needed to gather all the applicable standards from a variety of sources, um, and they include um, multilateral human rights treaties, um, international custom, um, many other human rights instruments, um, such as the Declaration of Commitment on HIV and AIDS, political declaration on HIV AIDS, and um, international guidelines on HIV AIDS and human rights. In addition to um, the analysis section, a report, each report published um, on the basis of the tool will have a country background section where we will explore such issues as status of the epidemic in a particular country, legal and infrastructural framework, um, and also we will look at how 
civil society and public uh, and private sectors um, are involved in the AIDS response. When you look at section number one, access to essential services, um, it consists of six factors, um, and they are public education, research, and information exchange, HIV prevention, um, factor three, testing, counseling, and referral. Then we have treatment, care, and other health services. Factor five is social protection and material assistance, and um, factor six is protection of privacy and confidentiality. Section two, equality of people living with HIV in public and private life, uh, consists of um, factor seven, political, social, and cultural life. Factor eight is family, sexual, and reproductive life. Then we have education and training, work, employment, and economic life, private and public housing, entry, stay, and residence, and this um, factor focuses mostly on the uh, travel restrictions for people with HIV around the world. And finally, um, factor 13 is on non-criminalization of HIV exposure and transmission. As I mentioned before, we have a separate section uh, devoted specifically to key populations. Um, we have women, um, we deal separately with children and youth. Um, we have a factor on people who use drugs, on adults engaged in commercial sex, sex workers, men who have sex with men and transgender people, and also people under state custody. And finally, in section four, um, we discuss um, issues related to access to justice for people um, who experience HIV-related discrimination and other violations of their human rights ba based on their health status. Um, we discuss legal protection to the right to, to legal remedy. Um, next is legal awareness, assistance, and representation, um, including a, a thorough discussion about um, legal aid. Um, and finally, access to a forum for trial and enforcement of remedies. There are many objectives and goals that are supposed to be achieved by implementing um, an HIV um, assessment uh, in, um, in a particular country. But it's really a tool that, um, that is supposed to provide a roadmap um, to address HIV-related discrimination in a particular country. So each report based on the tool would, will identify both best practices and challenges um, that the country faces um, with respect to HIV-related discrimination. And those challenges are you know, either in, in the laws or policies or in practices. Um, so um, it, it, each assessment, and it's true for free, all our assessment tool, will consist of both the jure analysis and the facto analysis. I mentioned this before, but I want to um, repeat it one more time. So the de jure analysis is, is, us, is, is based on um, uh, review, desk review of relevant laws, policies, and also secondary materials, and media reports. Um, and the fact analysis is based on um, in-country interview, interviews with key stakeholders. For most of our assessment, um, assessments, we spend approximately two to three weeks uh, in a country, um, both in the capital meeting with you know, key stakeholders from the government, from uh, major international um, uh, organizations from uh, civil society, and we also travel to locations, um, at least two or three locations, to see how laws um, and policies are implemented uh, at the local level. Um, and this, um, this is important because we know, although it's not always true with HIV AIDS, but we know that sometimes countries may have excellent laws on the books, but how those laws are implemented, um, it, it's really often a very, very different story. 
So among other objectives is to um, facilitate and enable prioritization of reforms, um, promote programming aid, aimed at improving access to justice for people with HIV, um, to empower local uh, civil society organizations to advance human rights um, in the context of HIV and AIDS, um, to enhance multi-sectoral and international cooperation, and to facilitate more adequate coverage of HIV um, epidemic and related discrimination in the media. So um, I would like to um, end um, with a quote from um, a landmark report published in July by the um, Global, Global Commission on HIV and AIDS. Um, the report is called HIV and the Law, Risk, Rights, and Health. And uh, the report states, the law alone cannot stop AIDS, nor can the law alone be blamed when HIV responses are inadequate. Where the legal environment can play a powerful role in the well-being of people living with HIV and those vulnerable to HIV. Good laws, fully resourced and rigorously enforced, can widen access to prevention and healthcare services, improve the quality of treatment, enhance social support for people affected by the epidemic, protect human rights that are vital to survival, and save the public money. Um, I'll be happy to take any questions either now or um, during breaks or after the event. Um, and again, I'm very excited to be able to present it to you. Thank you so much. Where do, where do we stand? Okay, yeah. Um, any uh, questions um, either on you know the tool itself or, or any other aspect of, of what we're doing? Cool. Um, so I have a question about how you were t you've been talking about when a report gets published. Yeah. So who is supposed to be using the tool and where are those reports going to be coming from? So who's going to be right. publishing those reports um, and, and how is that uh, work sort of facilitated, if it's not um, ADA really, um, then who's doing it and how do, how do we make it happen in, in various countries? Sure. So hopefully it will be ADA really, but, um, but the uh, methodology is publicly available, so pretty much anyone can implement it. Um, of course, we would like to be involved to, uh, to the you know, extent possible because um, we want to ensure the quality uh, control of, of each report uh, published on the basis of the methodology. And the way it usually happens is that, um, you know, we apply for funding. Sometimes um, donors approach us, sometimes we approach donors when we see a value of implementing um, a tool in a particular country. Um, when we receive funding, uh, we select the assessment team, which consists of um, international expert with thorough knowledge of the uh, relevant international legal standards. Um, this international expert is um, assisted by a local attorney with a thorough knowledge of the local laws. Um, and we uh, recommend um, for this methodology, but also for our other methodologies, that the implementation is um, community driven. So we recommend that uh, this methodology is implemented um, in close cooperation with a civil society organization. Um, and and this, this is for many different reasons. One of them is that we want to use this tool to really empower civil society organizations to, um, to, to develop and implement um, uh, programming based on the findings of the report. So if they are involved from the very beginning in the interviews and in the collection of information, they will be obviously very knowledgeable by the, by the, the, the conclusion of the assessment about what the gaps and challenges are, what they really need to address in the country. So that's, that's number one. Number two is that um, uh, civil society organizations have much better access to not only the laws, but also 
to hard to reach populations who need to be interviewed. Um, you know, it, it includes people living with HIV. It also includes, um, you know, key populations uh, in many, many countries. These are, you know, very marginalized populations that uh, may not be responsive to in, an international organization, you know, coming and asking all sorts of questions. And, and usually civil society organizations are able to really develop very intimate relationships with those populations. Um, so, so I think it's 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 sort of a mutual uh, benefit for, for us and for those organizations. Um, we also feel that it's important to um, to involve law students. So, uh, you know, I'm going to be recommending that we partner with maybe um, uh, legal clinics or you know groups of students that are interested. Because they can, you know, the, the sooner we involve law students in, in this type of research and in this type of programming, the better for, for, for the future of the legal profession because they will be better equipped to assist people living with HIV and um, affected populations. Um, and in terms of the audience, um, so this is, this is really for policymakers and for decision makers. This is to identify again what the challenges are in the laws and in the implementation of the laws and hopefully you know showing them how certain laws affect HIV response will you know change their minds in terms of you know repealing or amending certain laws um, and enforcing good laws in practice but also um, this tool is uh, directed at um, uh, justice um, system actors. Um, we hope that you know the tool can be used to uh, really train judges and sensitize them to uh, to to you know HIV um, related issues. Um, in many countries, law enforcement is a is a big problem uh, in terms of. Um, uh, you know, bad repressive policing practices against um, vulnerable populations. Um, and journalists, um, you know, the HIV is not always well covered in the media. There are a lot of misconceptions. Um, so, you know, having a report that clearly states, um, you know, evidence-based, evidence um, you know, uh, information uh, might be very, very helpful to them. And of, of course, as I mentioned before, before civil society organizations, international organizations. But it's, it's the primary audience. It's really the uh, policy makers, the decision makers, and justice system actors. Uh, I'll also add just a, a couple of uh, comments onto that. Um, if we, uh, now that the tool has, has been finished and released, you know, we'll be looking for opportunities to run some pilot assessments. So we haven't yet had the opportunity to run the tool. But based on our prior experience with our other assessments that we've run over the past 12 years, um, you know, this is in keeping with our philosophy that this is intended to be uh, constructive criticism. Um, we are not trying to play sort of the name and shame role. Um, you know, other organizations do that, and there's certainly you know, a role for that. Um, you know, uh, because we have, you know, ongoing programs um, in most of the countries, you know, in which we work and run these types of assessments, what we're trying to do is prioritize uh, reform needs uh, in the context of the relevant um, international framework um, so that we can help uh, those who are, you know, committed to reform, whether it's at the grassroots level um, with, you know, local CSOs and, and lawyers and law students, um, or whether it's at you know, the highest levels of government, so that we can then work with them um, to help push uh, reform forward. Uh, so it, it's all about um, it being sort of a, a collaborative mechanism for advocating for and driving reform forward. Uh, any, yes? Sure. The question was, how has the tool been received um, so far? You know, at, like, well, like I said, we haven't had the opportunity to implement it yet. 
Um, and so we're just having kind of initial discussions with uh, potential countries where we might be able to run it. Um, you know, just because of, you know, the nature of the beast of, of reform work is that we're, you know, obviously grant driven. Um, and so, you know, we don't have sort of a pot of money to just sort of say, okay, we have a new tool, we're going to go run out and then pick, you know, a dozen countries to go run pilot assessments in. So we're currently engaging in, in, in uh, discussions. Um, you know, I don't know if you want to talk about, you know, UNDP or... Uh, okay, I mean, we, you, know, we're, you know, our most promising uh, kind of lead at the moment is with uh, UNDP in uh, Jamaica. Um, which is very interested in uh, in implementing the tool. Um, you know, we hope hopefully that will uh, you know will bear fruit, so to speak, and we'll be able to run the tool with them. Um, but you know, they looked at what they're trying to accomplish, and they believe that there is um, sort of a, a very fertile moment for uh, driving reform forward um, in this area, and they see uh, the, the tool. Um, as an absolutely, you know, critical part of, of that effort um, and, and the role that it can play. So, you know, they've been very, very positive about it. Um, and we hope that, obviously, that, you know, enthusiasm will carry over to the governments themselves um, and that they will see it as a constructive mechanism um, as opposed to something that's sort of heavy-handed and, and just, you know, critical. I should add to it that, um, you know, the tool was um, developed with the assistance uh, provided by USAID and um, USAID and um, Global Health Initiative um, had multiple <coughs> discussions with us uh, about implementing the tool. You know, they are very excited about um, this, this whole multi-sectoral issue that, that Simon was talking about at the very beginning and they want to see the tool implemented in multiple countries. But to be um, honest, I mean, it is a fairly new sort of approach to development. Um, of course, the U.S. government is talking a lot now about um, integrated approach to development and, you know, multi-sectoral approach um, and that we have to merge, um, you know, democracy and governance um, with people, with uh, health people and food security people, um, so on and so forth. But the problem is that, that those people involved in those different fields are not used to talking to each other. And that um, creates a problem in terms of funding mechanisms because who is going to fund it? Is it going to be, let's say it's the U.S. government, is it going to be democracy and governance people? Is it going to be, you know, a global health initiative? They really have to figure out how to really implement that multi-sectoral approach in practice. Uh, sort of a two-part question, and I think you've identified one of the things that is driving sort of um, the choice about which countries this might be uh, implemented in first, right? Um, and that would be, you know, resources, yeah. right, mm -hmm. to, to do it. Um, but I, I'm wondering what the other factors are in terms of sort of choosing or trying to uh, target particular countries to, to, to try and generate interest mm -hmm. in using the methodology. And then uh, the second part is, I'm wondering um, the extent to which uh, it has been considered to start with the United States um, and sort of lead by example, you know, developed by the ABA, by USAID. Um, I guess when I look at the tool, um, I go, wow, it would actually be interesting to see how the United States fares um, under this assessment. And so I'm wondering if that um, has been considered as a way to um, to move the process forward is to have the U.S. you know step up and do it first. Um, sure, I'll answer the U.S. question first. So uh, we, as the ABA Rule of Law Initiative, do not have um, sort of authority to implement programming in the United States. So we um, we cannot do it. But again, the um, methodology is open to the public, and um, you know if any other organization is interested in running the tool in the United States, you know we can provide assistance training uh, that organization on the methodology. I'm sure it would be, uh, you know, fascinating to see uh, a report uh, uh, published on, on the U.S. 
legal response to, to, to HIV. Um, in fact, we, we you know we had similar discussions about our um, human trafficking assessment tool. Um, but again, it's 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 not within the scope of our work. Um, uh, and in terms of criteria um, for running the tool um, in other countries, um, I mean, we, we, we definitely look at the HIV uh, prevalence. Um, you know, for pragmatic reasons, we, uh, we would like to pilot the, the tool in an English-speaking country just because, uh, you know, running a tool in a, in a country uh, with a different language, uh, it's, it's just additional cost. Um, uh, we uh, look at um, what type of partnerships we have already established in, in um, you know, many countries. We, we, you know, especially in sub-Saharan Africa, um, uh, because partnerships are, are always extremely important. So th these are um, sort of the main, uh, the main criteria that we are considering. But again, it unfortunately, unfortunately, always comes down to uh, resources. And there might be some, you know, there certainly would be utility to running it um, in the U.S. And obviously that has some appeal of sort of using that as sort of the flagship, you know, pilot, if you will. Um, but other than it being outside our scope of work, um, uh, there's also the added uh, difficulty that particularly for a pilot assessment, uh, you, you generally don't want to start with a country as large as the U.S. Um, it's easier to implement it. Um, in you know a smaller country where you've got more control over the implementation, there's just less complexity and less variables that you have to take into account, um, and so it's uh, you you want to start with something you know a little bit easier. Uh, but yeah, it, it's certainly you know the methodology is intended to be international and you know used worldwide, and that that would include the U.S. Yeah, well, I think it uh, that makes sense to me that it, for the pilot programs at least it makes sense to go with a smaller country. I guess I'm unfamiliar. Maybe you could explain a little bit more as to what the restrictions are in terms of um, the scope of Roe's work, okay. that you can't do work in sure. the United States. Because I don't you understand know, we, that. And actually, yeah. I, I guess I feel like, you know, it sort of does put us in the place of the United States telling the rest of the world what they are supposed to be doing without sort of a critical self-evaluation. And so, you could address it. Yeah, no, it's, it's a very legitimate question. And unless you're privy to, you know, the internal sort of structure of the ABA, it's, you know, it does seem um, maybe a little counterintuitive. But, you know, the ABA is really a, an amalgamation of many, many different uh, sort of entities, um, of which Rowley is just one. Um, I don't know if you recall the, the number that Jack threw out at one of his most recent meetings about how many sort of entities and... More than 3,000 separate entities. Each dealing with different aspects of the law. This is the problem when you get a whole bunch of lawyers together. You know, we, um, um, so, uh, you know, each entity within the ABA has its own sort of area, you know, its own jurisdiction um, in, in which it can work. Where, you know, Roley is the international technical assistance arm, so we can only work um, overseas. Um, but like Paulina said, you know, this is uh, an open methodology. Um, anyone is free to use it. So even if another part of the ABA, like the HIV AIDS Coordinating Committee, you know, if they wanted to get behind um, a, a U.S. assessment, um, then you know that is something that we would certainly sort of work with them on and, and let them you know sort of take the lead on. So uh, it's not that we're opposed to it. It's just that you know we have our own little portion that, that we're allowed to work on and um, you know try not to step on too many toes. Right. Uh, thanks. I think we have a new mandate. <laughs> um, if I could ask really quickly, um, yeah. congratulations, first of all, on the assessment tool. It's fantastic. Um, I'm curious, though, obviously this hasn't had a chance to be implemented yet, but with the other assessment tools, do you find a common sort of uh, difficulty or set of difficulties in the implementation of the assessment tool or some of the challenges that are found through the use of the assessment tool, whether it's law enforcement, Paulina mentioned, um, or that it tends to be civil society that uses it more and government's perhaps less responsive? Is there sort of a common thread or are they all very distinct? Um, I mean, they are distinct because certain issues are more threatening than others. Um, for example, uh, you know, it, it's much easier for governments to get behind, let's just say, a legal education assessment 
um, than it is, you know, like a, you know, a judicial reform assessment or a prosecutorial assessment. Now that said, there are always kind of exceptions to the rule. Um, and, you know, we had one very, very successful instance in Bulgaria where we were running a prosecutorial assessment. Um, and in some cases, these tools are developed because someone comes to us and says, you know, can you do so? In other cases, um, you know, it, like this, we sort of generated the idea and we do a sort of build it and they will come kind of philosophy. With the prosecutorial assessment, it was uh, OPDAT, um, part of the Department of Justice, that came to us um, and asked us, you know, can you do the sort of assessments um, for prosecutors uh, that you do for judges? And so we said, sure. We developed the methodology and uh, we ran it in Bulgaria because there was a new prosecutor general there who was very reform-minded um, and was eager to, you know, have some sort of, uh, you know, objective framework for uh, advancing his reform agenda. Um, we are actually just finishing the third prosecutorial assessment um, in Bulgaria. Um, these are designed to be sort of implemented in rounds uh, where possible so that you can track reform over a period of time. And uh, that, uh, the specific reason why we're running it for the third uh, and probably final time um, is because the Prosecutor General's tenure is coming to an end, um, and he sees the, uh, the prosecutorial assessment as a way of capturing his, his legacy, um, if you will. And so it, it's an instance where you had a very top-level, you know, government official who, you know, saw the potential uh, in, uh, in, in the tool, um, and after we had uh, implemented it for the first time, they created um, a national PRI implementation committee um, for implementing the findings um, of the assessment. So, you know, if it's uh, run like that, it can obviously be very, very helpful. Um, in other instances, you know, it's going to be more uh, useful from, you know, a grassroots level, uh, giving local CSOs and, and other local advocates the, the information um, to, to help spur, you know, spur um, their own reform efforts. Um, I don't know if you wanted to comment sure, on I, any of I the... Mean, we, can, we can maybe talk a little bit about, about challenges. I mean, obviously, yeah. um, you know, as, as with any rule of law programming and the type of development programming, really, uh, there are always challenges, and they, they can come from, you know, sort of diff many different um, sort of sources. <laughs> Um, you know, so in some countries, um, we need to get permission from the government to meet with certain government officials, and sometimes we don't get that permission that, you know, creates um, problems in, in obtaining um, you know, all data, that, the data that we want to obtain for the assessment. Um, you know, there are challenges in, in getting statistical information, and sometimes if the government you know, unwillingness to provide us that data, but also sometimes it's that, you know, many governments just don't, uh, don't uh, keep their records, you know, and they, it, it sometimes access to, to, to certain information is difficult. Um, you know, sometimes I, you know, I, we, 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 we do have to admit that we, um, you know, we are perceived as the, you know, American um, organization. I mean, I remember, you know, during one of our assessments uh, a couple of years ago, you know, some interviewees called us, you know, the agents, secret service agents, something rather of the, you know, government, and they wouldn't, you know, agree to, to, uh, to an interview. Um, so things like this are happening, uh, but, um, you know, usually, uh, always really we work with you know many different partners um, both you know from the government and from the civil society so one way or another we, we do get that information but the challenges do, uh, do occur um, if you identify like if a country goes through this and there you identify weaknesses in their laws or um, you have what, while you're developing this, did you come up with like model laws or like a recommendation, or would that be something that you develop right. in the process? Or I saw you had like case studies here. I wasn't sure if those are supposed to be kind of examples. Or uh, the case studies included in the um, assessment manual are examples, um, but we. Um, 
we we develop recommendations um, uh, on a case by case basis. Um, it depends if you know if the donor requests it. Um, we we develop a set of recommendations. You know, if a partner requests it, sometimes it's a part of an assessment. Some part, sometimes it's a part. It's it's a separate document that we submit to um, our partners. So it really depends on the assessment um, and on the you know on the request of the donor. We we try to be as you know context driven as possible in terms of you know the needs of the specific country, as opposed to having sort of more of a cookie cutter approach and having sort of a sort of a standard menu of, of reform, um, if you will, to say, look, you know, check these boxes off and that'll take care of your problem. So, you know, it's the assessment is really just a first step in the reform process. Um, and, you know, it identifies sort of the strengths and weaknesses in the country, um, you know, offers, uh, you know, some recommendations, but then there needs to be sort of the follow-on effort you know, working with wherever the reform levers are in the country, whether it's in the government or, or elsewhere, um, to help design, you know, uh, sort of reform options that are that are most likely to be successful based upon the particular conditions um, in a country. And really, if we if we do um, provide recommendations, they are not sort of like arbitrary, you know, points. ABA recommends that you do this and this, but they are always based on, you know, what the stakeholders are, are telling us during the course of the interview period. You know, they, they always, you know, they, they talk about what um, the state of the law and, you know, the, the implementation of the law is from their perspectives, but they also tell us, you know, it would be good if this was changed, you know, it, it would be good if this law was amended. Um, and we take their opinions and their um, sort of input into consideration while um, uh, developing recommendations. So they don't really sound like, you know, orders from an international organization to, to the country. It's really collaborative effort. All right. Well, thank you very much for uh, your attention and all of your questions. We're happy to, to talk with you more, uh, you know, after the event or during the breaks. Um, but I think we should probably move on to the next portion of the presentation and, um, and turn things over to, uh, to Michael Pakes and the other members of the, the HIV AIDS uh, Coordinating Committee.